Thanks for tuning in. This is Agriculture Today. We've been visiting in recent weeks about the upcoming Cattlemen's Day at Kansas State University. The 105th edition is set for a week from this Friday, March the 2nd, here in Manhattan. Now, an event that is always directly aligned with Cattlemen's Day is the Legacy Bull Sale. And we want to share some information on that in the next few minutes, but also talk about some things to consider as you go about your bull purchases if you're in the market this spring. Bob Weber is with us once more, cow-calf specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And we'll get into the lots that will be available at the Legacy Bull Sale in just a second, Bob. But what are some of the things that you think that those who will be purchasing bulls should keep well in mind as they head off to the sales this spring? Yeah, thanks, Eric, for having me. And uh, I think this time of year is really a good one to to sort of plot out a trajectory and and be really strategic in our our bull investments. And uh, I sort of like to think about this topic as you know, how as a bull buyer do I get the most out of that investment? Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, over the last few years, uh, bull prices have have gone up uh, substantially. And uh, with that, uh, I think uh, both the genetic potential of those bulls, uh, by and large, across many organizations and, and breeders have improved, but um, it's not uh, unreasonable to think about um, how do I get the most bang out of that investment. Um, And so a lot of it has to do with um, setting yourself up to make a really good and informed purchase decision. Um, But then there's uh, uh, sort of after the purchase things that we need to think about as well in terms of uh, management of the bull um, during his first and second breeding seasons that we need to think about too. Well, let's start with genetic selection and to put it this way, what's hot in the area of EPDs and other measurements? Great question, Eric. This bull buying season uh, uh, really marks one of, uh, uh, I think, substantial change for uh, many producers in terms of uh, genetic evaluation. Of course, uh, seed stock producers have been sort of engaged in um, those changes um, uh, predominantly through uh, American Angus Association's change to a single-step genomics uh, methodology uh, last summer. Um, But for those of you that uh, only buy bulls in the spring and spring calvers. Um, this will be the first bull buying season that you've gone through and purchased bulls um, with that technology. Uh, a number of other breed associations uh, involved with the IGS group will have single step predictions available later in the spring, so they don't have quite as many changes to deal with as Angus breeders do. But uh, uh, really, the benefits are uh, substantial to commercial bull buyers. Genomics technologies have uh, really matured and, and had brought adoption uh, across the seed stock sector, not just in Angus, but a number of other breeds as well. And so producers, uh, commercial producers, that is, get the benefit of buying bulls that have genomically enhanced EPDs, that is, genomic data included in their prediction. And that adds accuracy, adds value to the purchase decision in terms of decreased risk, um, in terms of uh, that bull's genetic potential. So, you know, if you're buying a, a calving ease bull, for example, the genomic data adds the equivalent of that bull's first or maybe part of its first and second calf crops equivalent in terms of data contribution. So you really get uh, sort of the the essence of a partially progeny tested bull in your yearling bull purchase. And so that's a big advancement to offer to to commercial cattlemen is that added accuracy. And there's really no reason for an individual to shy away from exploiting that genomic information that's out there then. Right. It's it's really valuable. Of course, as as a seed stock vendor, um, it's got some cost associated with in terms of testing, um, but it helps um, uh, a lot in terms of you know accuracy. It helps seed stock producers in terms of mating decisions, which replacement females to potentially keep and the like. So it does it contributes a lot of value to our selection systems, and that uh, that should translate into uh, improved predictability and performance um, of those bulls for their commercial customers. What else might one think about? You did mention that post-purchase, you need to factor in, well, I have that animal now. How do I assure that its performance is going to be what I paid for. Basically. Right. That's a, a great approach. And I think uh, really two things. One's, you know, the pre-purchase part is is largely based on selection. So making sure that we have the right traits in our decision-making process. So, you know, if we're going to buy a calving ease bull, we actually buy a calving ease bull and not a terminal sire. Or if we're going for a terminal bull, we actually buy one of those and not a calving ease the like. So making sure we're very focused in, in our objective and in being disciplined in our purchase decision. Um, but once we've got that bull bought, I think it's, it's really important that 
that we take good care of that, particularly a yearling bull going out to service cows. Um, you know, a good rule of thumb for uh, bulls less than two years of age is um, their exposure is uh, one cow per month of age. So if you're turning out, you know, a 12 or 13 month old bull on a group of cows, he should be expected to serve 12 or 13 cows. Uh, it's best uh, often to uh, turn that bull out either in a, a cohort of similarly aged bulls. So if you're turning out a bunch of yearlings, turn them out. It's typically not advised to turn out a yearling bull with an aged bull. They'll get in a big fight yeah. and there's one of those is going to lose and it's the one you just bought. Yeah. So taking some uh, care and sort of strategically deploying your bull resources can really help manage those sort of social issues, if you will, and in the breeding pasture. One of the other strategies to think about is if you are turning out a, a set of uh, yearling bulls uh, on, a say, a 90-day breeding season, is don't turn them all out at once. Right, So turn out a couple of bulls for maybe the first 30 or 45 days of the breeding season um, with an appropriate number of cows, again, one per month of age. Partway through the breeding season, replace him with a cohort uh, of bulls that can fill in that gap then, and, and so you don't use him for the whole breeding season. One of the things we uh, often see is um, uh, yearling bulls turned out with a group of cows and left out all season, maybe left out clear to weaning time, and uh, they come in kind of wrung out and not too good a body condition, and that's pretty tough on them in terms of longevity. Those bulls are young and still trying to grow, and so it's not unreasonable to expect uh, some additional groceries for those guys. Um, in the bachelor pad, as you prepare for the next year's breeding season, Season. Good ideas all, and in fact, we're lifting from an article that you have in the Legacy Bull Sale catalog that's available, and that segues us right into that sale, which is upcoming toward the latter end of Cattleman's Day. And you're very excited, Bob, about what's on offer here through this sale. Right. So like uh, a lot of uh, university events, we try and, uh, you know, add educational value to about everything we do. And certainly, uh, you know, there's a couple articles, uh, as you mentioned, in, in the catalog to help with just that. As an extension guy, it's pretty hard to pass up an opportunity to spread <laughs> some uh, some good information. Right. The other bits that uh, uh, sort of stand out in this year's legacy sale, um, one is um, um, it's our first uh, calving season and uh, production cycle in our new facilities uh, here at K-State. And I won't kid you there's been a, a couple of real learning experiences for both professor and student um, <laughs> over the last few months, but uh, we're really excited about the offering and uh, uh, the opportunities um, that we've got in front of us uh, uh, here at K-State in our peer red unit. To remind, this sale is conducted by students. Correct. So uh, we've got uh, a seed stock marketing course um, that uh, is, is basically kind of acts as sale manager, if you will. So we've had, uh, for those of you that have got the catalogs, they went out in the mail here about a, uh, well, right at a week ago. And so they should be, for most of the people in Kansas uh, that are on our catalog list, uh, um, should have those in hand. If you didn't get one and would like one, uh, uh, be sure and call us uh, and uh, we can get one of those shipped off to you. If you're uh, uh, the internet type, um, if you just Google search 2018 legacy sale, the whole catalog is available via PDF, just like the paper copy. So you get all the same info. Plus, uh, um, we've got uh, the videos are posted up of uh, all the bulls that uh, we have on offer, so you can um, see them just as good uh, online as in the flesh. Shortly, we'll have uh, some feed intake and feed efficiency data um, and an updated set of EPDs for the bulls. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier is uh, um, you know genetics technologies, and one of the, the really challenging things for both us as seed stock producers and I'm sure many commercial producers is, you know, for instance, the Angus EPDs change every week, um, and so we, we try and keep uh, everybody up to speed and updated on what the current numbers are. And of course, we've been submitting ultrasound data and genomic information, um, yearling weight data just recently as well. And so all the numbers change just about every day, it seems. But we'll uh, we'll do our best to keep everybody in the loop on uh, the performance data. We've got uh, about 30 bulls in the sale this year. Um, roughly uh, half of them are, are Angus bulls. In addition to our Angus bulls, we've got two really high indexing uh, uh, Simmental bulls that we're really proud of and a couple of Hereford standouts as well.
And the sale will feature females as well. Right. So we've got about 37 cows, spring calver cows in, in the list um, that be preg checked, actually follow up preg checked tomorrow. So um, we'll have uh, have those on, on offer. Uh, again, about half of those Angus cows and then a mixture of Simmental and Hereford as well. It'll be an excellent round. And of course, all proceedings will take place at the Stanley Stout Center toward the north end of the campus. And it'll be around 3.30, thereabouts, following the cattle. Day program. That's right. And uh, we'll uh, have bulls on display both Thursday at the new purebred unit and uh, on Friday there at the display pens um, at the Stanley Stout Marketing Center. Excellent. It is the 2018 Legacy Bull Sale hosted by K-State Animal Sciences and Industry Department and the students who will be conducting that sale as the uh, capstone, if you will, of Cattleman's Day 2018 here at the university. Bob, thank you for the preview. Great. Thanks, Eric. Cow-Calf Specialist Bob Weber, K-State Research and Extension. It's all happening on Friday, March the 2nd. You can find out more about the overall program at ksubeef.org. For more on the sale directly, simply search for 2018 K-State Legacy Bull Sale, and that'll take you right to all of this information. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we're edging ever closer to the prescribed burning season in Kansas for pasture managers that conduct that practice routinely. Now, the weather this year may alter those plans a bit, but principally, we want to talk about the concept of prescribed burn associations and their merits. Joining us once again from the Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University is fire protection specialist Jason Hartman, who also happens happens to be the coordinator of the Prescribed Fire Council here in the state of Kansas, and that's intertwined with this idea of burn associations. Before we talk of those, though, Jason, we do want to put out a what is now a constant reminder about our worries over wildfires in Kansas this year. Yes, we do need to be cognizant of that, In uh, sometimes not in February, but this year definitely already we do need to be watching uh, weather conditions, looking we haven't had measurable moisture for going on over 100 days in some parts of the state, and other parts are going on still a long time, uh, even in those that are considered to be not as bad off. So any day with winds, low humidity, uh, will be a day to be extra cautious. And that will be a theme that will be repeated for some weeks yet as we get into the prescribed burning season for sure. These associations, prescribed burn associations by title, what is the concept here? Well, it's a concept that I believe started in uh, West Central Texas, if I'm remembering my history right. Just an, an effort to recognize that not very many individuals or individual operations that have all the manpower, equipment, expertise, and et cetera that go into conducting burns of a size and scale that often need to be done to keep uh, rangelands and native prairies uh, managed in, with fire. So it was an effort to still keeping the, the local landowners in control of the organization, just kind of formalize what's always been done with uh, rural operations of neighbors helping neighbors, just make it a little more formalized uh, and bring together the equipment and experience and manpower of, of several different individuals and, organization and uh, operations to all conduct burns together. And you mentioned several factors that lead to these, and those are often the reasons that landowners don't like to burn, as a matter of fact. So those are addressed directly through the formation of these, right? Very true. Yeah, a lot of times lack of equipment, lack of manpower, uh, lack of experience or comfort level with burning are some of the main restrictions to having more fire on the landscape. So PBAs just try to address those just by default, by their mere nature, they address all those issues. This idea has taken root several places in Kansas now. There's, what, over a dozen of these associations formed now and officially in place? Yeah, correct, Eric. If I'm remembering 
my numbers correctly, there's 13 that are what we call local prescribed burn associations where they're, some of them are follow county boundaries, some of them follow a, a geographic area, some of them are just, they, they don't really confine themselves to any boundaries on a map necessarily. Uh, and so there's 13 of those that go from nearly uh, the western border to the eastern and from the north to the south spread out pretty well. And then there's one additional that's a statewide because the Kansas Prescribed Burn Association, that's kind of a parent organization to all the local ones. There is a structure involved in putting these together. There is a little bit of a, a structure to it, especially uh, if a local chapter wishes to become a, a affiliate of the state organization. There is definitely some uh, additional steps to be taken to do all that properly because the state association is a 501c3 organization. So with that comes some definite uh, IRS paperwork stuff to follow along with those, but there's benefits to that. So there is just a little bit of some bylaws, some guidance, and maybe an annual meeting and some officers that does have to be developed. But you mentioned there are benefits to being an affiliate, and what would those be? Well, a, a lot of times, you know, they, they do pool resources, but additional resources are always very helpful to an organization like this. Anyone wishing to donate to a local that is an affiliate of the state would have the benefits of their donating to a, a tax-exempt educational organization. So there is that benefit. The The state organization is trying to just be kind of an umbrella, be there to provide support, provide somebody to lean on for, hey, how do I do this? Because they've all been there, kind of been through it. They're some of the people that have been involved with PBAs for the longest time, form the state organization. So they have a lot of advice and expertise to lend to those that are just getting started. So just that help with gaining equipment, gaining experience, and just a, a person to ask questions to. One of the keys there in training and formal training in fire control, fire behavior, managing a, a prescribed burn, all of that's possible through one of these, right? Yes, it is. I mean, that's not by any means exclusive to PBAs only, but right. PBAs just sometimes they're able to work together and talk with each other about having a, a specific question they're wanting to learn about. A couple of years ago, there were some of the ones down in South Central really wanted to work on how to be the, the fire boss. And so they kind of organized a training amongst themselves just for that topic. And mm -hmm. just a couple of weeks ago, there was a group in eastern Kansas that was, I talked to them about maybe let's do something with developing a burn plan. So we went and did that specific topic. So they are able to do that, bring that kind of fine detail training to their members. When members of an association come together and conduct a specific burn on a place or maybe two or three places at once, who's liable for the fire in case something would go awry, that fire escapes? Well, the PBA exists to bring people together. Uh, the burns are still being conducted by the landowner or the land manager of the property. The PBA is an organization that's kind of in the background, if you will, that brought the equipment and the people together and the training and the planning to make it happen. But mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily the burn association itself that is doing the burning. So as far as that, it's still everybody involved still needs to have – you can't forego having the responsibility to have the proper insurance coverage, and that's actually part of the bylaws of every association is that each member has to make sure they have the appropriate insurance coverage. So it's not a, not a replacement to that at all. By the same token, these associations can work closely with, say, rural fire departments, can they not, in regard to all the things associated with a safe burn? Yes, that's, that's been seen quite a bit in other states. Some of the ones that have had PBAs longer, they do have a very close relationship with the fire department where the PBAs will actually come in and kind of follow up the suppression crews and uh, do some of that patrolling and cleanup work. Uh, and we have seen some of that even in Kansas. Some of the PBAs that have been around a little bit longer are starting to have that relationship start. And it's, it's an excellent combination of uh, the fire departments have usually the larger bigger pump trucks that can do the knockdown, and, and the PBAs are very much used to kind of that patrol and, and make sure everything stays under under uh, wraps type of mode, and so they work pretty well together usually. Well, Jason, you've seen this idea grow in Kansas. Likely, you would encourage further growth in this direction. Yeah, the Fire Council is uh, very interested in that, and we have worked with several partners to find funding to have what we call regional fire coordinators, one in the southwest, one in northwest, and just started one in north central Kansas, who that's one of their main main roles and functions, is to provide support to existing PBAs and to encourage additional PBAs forming mm -hmm. in those areas that are 
not had as, as much fire as maybe the landscape would need to have, but there's not as much of an accepted fire culture. So that's where they've been placed initially. Uh, we've also, the council members have worked in other parts of the state as well uh, to encourage PBAs to form. So is there a recipe to follow in getting one of these started? Oh, not, not necessarily. The big thing is to make sure you have sufficient interest from a local group that are willing to commit to that group of a board of directors or a president, vice president, secretary. You see, that's kind of one of the first steps. Make sure you have that interest. And then make sure you have the buy-in of some of the, your local, uh, like the fire district, emergency management. Uh, reach out to those folks ahead of time that this is what is being thought about doing. Their uh, PBAs were thinking about forming it, explain what it is, what it's not, just to kind of have their buy-in as well. And, and uh, it, it's also really good, while the, the key and the goal is always that it maintains that it's ran by and the members are landowners, never hurts to have that kind of agency support, whether it be extension NRCS, uh, through the fire council coordinators, uh, through Kansas Forest Service. It, it's always good to have that uh, to help keep things moving with, with a group like this. So where might a party or a group of people turn to to gather more information and to figure out how to head down the path of establishing a, a local or an area prescribed burn association? Yep. The Kansas Prescribed Fire Council, we have those regional coordinators in, in those areas of the state I mentioned that are very willing to assist with that. You can find information on how to contact them. It's actually our website is part of the Kansas Grazing Land Coalition website, so we can be found information there. Um, if nothing else, I know it at least has my contact information and I can help out. Or if you know of somebody that's been involved with one, reach out to them. Yeah. Again, what we're visiting about prescribed burn associations organized locally by landowners to collectively conduct prescribed burns and with all the attributes of having a large group take that on, including safety, uh, ability to control the fire, and so forth. You can learn more at the Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition website, or you can go to the Kansas Forest Service website to link to all of that. That's kansasforests.org. We appreciate you coming over, Jason, and we'll likely be having you back soon as we get into the prescribed fire season. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. He is Jason Hartman. Fire Protection Specialist, Kansas Forest Service at K-State. Once more, he's also the coordinator of the Prescribed Fire Council here in the state of Kansas. And we'll be back with more. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. When finished, this puzzle will be 12 by 36 inches. That's one foot by three feet. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. This may have been frivolous, a frivolous use of time, but it surely has been fun. The big dining room table was cleaned and the 500 pieces of the jigsaw puzzle were spread out and turned over. Even though I at first thought that 500 pieces were not that many, the puzzle would not be difficult enough, I soon found out I was mistaken. The puzzle was my youngest daughter's idea. She had read or heard somewhere that the exercise of a puzzle, a good puzzle, was great therapy for the mind. She was thinking about her mother after the operation and earlier the mini-stroke. I'm not a puzzle man. I've no patience and can't sit that long. However, I too got intrigued by this puzzle. Maybe it was the scene. 
but I think it was the challenge, and in the beginning, to help Annika, my wife, get started. There is a process which is to try to find those pieces which end frame, the outer pieces, starting with the four corners. You got to start somewhere. Remember, the table was full of pieces. When finished, this puzzle will be 12 by 36 inches, one foot by three feet. Recommended ages, eight and up. The theme of the puzzle was storytelling. The artwork done by Steve Reed. Thank goodness this puzzle was, as it said, proudly made in the USA. Made with soy-based inks on recycled board. That's the way it should be, or the way I like it. The scene was a young American Indian woman watched by others, in front of a teepee with a glowing campfire, telling a story through dance. The single dancer held two eagle feathers, one feather in each hand. The background, snow-covered mountains with a long valley out of the mountains, with a river flowing out and sweeping by the campsite. A large, full moon rising above the valley, there are wolves and eagles and a setting sun. There is the web of life woven in a circle, decorated with feathers. The dresses are all deerskin decorated with beads. It's a rich, peaceful American scene. But think about the colors, both vivid and blending. I'd like to meet the eight-year-old doing and finishing this puzzle. No way. Looking again at the finished puzzle, I was stumped by the pieces which showed the reflection of a wolf drinking from the stream. The wolves at ease around the campfire reminded me of our German shepherds. I still try to understand why the puzzle intrigued me. Of course, it was the doing, the reaching for the pieces to finish a small part. The evening and dark sky was a challenge, with the treetops and the branches allowing evening light to come through. The last of the fading day. But there was more. Somehow, it reminded me of a photo I took many, many years ago of Anneke, my wife, while we were still in Australia. We went swimming in the Hawkesbury River, which ran by the so-called River Farm, all part of the Hawkesbury College where I was a student in my final year. To cool off on a hot day, we would bike to the river on a weekend. I took a photo of Annika standing in the river, washing her then long hair. It's a great photo in a great river flowing along the high ridge with a gentle curve. The river made up of streams coming out of the Blue Mountains. Later, when I managed the dairy farm, we pumped water out of the river to irrigate. But then I was so busy I never dove in the river again to swim. I had no time. It would have been frivolous. It's true. You're only young once. Anyway, we will go on puzzling. Yes, I know you have no time. Cows are calving and pigs are pigging. And you have to stay mindful and watchful. You have to think crops. By now fertilizer should be applied to the brome. Too many things to do and so little time to do them all. I'm not even talking about the machinery. But you're young. Or you have some younger ones to follow you. And that makes a difference. I just looked at the annual bull sale catalog of a friend of mine with four pages of family photos showing and sharing their family operation. I recognize some of the photos taken on our property, the bailer chasing the windrower, trying to catch up, young blood laughing. I realize that some farms are like a puzzle. Our land with many separate fields, small fields, surely is. I have a thought for a good Kansas puzzle. It shows 
miles and miles of range, grasses, grasses, and more grasses under a wide sky. Through a wide open valley comes and grazes a large herd of buffalo. And if you don't like buffalo, make it a herd of black Angus or Herefords. Just think, picking up those pieces with a stripe of white, white faces. Which leg or tail goes where? To add some variation, draw in a large pond with smooth water reflecting the sky, cows drinking along the edge. Enough said. You better go and check on your calves. You never get that puzzle done. Our next puzzle has been selected and bought songbirds sitting in a lots of greenery. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Our time's away for today, as always. Thanks to you for listening in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.